Hey, 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 it's the Pick 6 Mock Draft Show, uh, part of the Pick 6 Podcast Network. I just made that up, Debo. No, Will Brinson, as I always like to say on Tuesdays, it's me, Ryan Wilson, Chris Paso, Josh Edwards. We cover the draft for CBS Sports, and we're talking drafts. So uh, this is episode four, I believe. So we're three weeks into this thing, and um, so far, so good, I feel like. But uh, this week, before we get started, um, remember... You can do all this. We're on YouTube, obviously. This is YouTube exclusive, but you can follow the Pick Six Podcast on YouTube, Pick Six Podcast slash or YouTube.com slash Pick Six. Uh, subscribe, turn on the bell notification so you're alerted every time something goes live. And we do a lot of live stuff uh, after all the national games. Sometimes we do the live podcast uh, draft show. So click the bell notification. You can like and comment. And this particular episode about your favorite prospect in 2022 draft. Uh, as I mentioned, we do this show every Tuesday, so uh, if we don't get to your comments uh, this week, we'll certainly get to them at some point. And uh, yeah, let's get to this thing. So this week we're talking about the uh, the prospects, like all of them. We updated the, the prospect rankings last week, me, Chris, and Josh. And uh, admittedly, we hadn't done that since I think early September. So a lot had changed uh, because we're now two and a half months into the college football season. And as usually happens, some guys have uh, made their way up the old prospect rankings list, and some guys have made their way in the other direction. And uh, we're going to talk about it today. So you can check out the actual updated list at cbsports.com slash NFL slash draft slash prospect rankings if you are so inclined. And uh, I'm going to be honest, and traps, I'll start with you. The number one guy in terms of the accurate rankings among the three of us wasn't my my guy Kayvon Thibodeau, or wasn't my one A Aiden Hutchinson? It was uh, Kyle Hamilton. I don't know if you or Josh had more to do with that, but traps will let you start. How do you feel about Kyle Hamilton uh, as the number one prospect in the twenty twenty two class? Right now, I feel pretty good about it. I mean, he is injured right now, uh, and that would really be the only. I don't know if it's a red flag, but the fact that we are still seeing Aiden Hutchinson playing and Kayvon Thibodeau playing, they could overtake Kyle Hamilton down the stretch. Michigan and Oregon. Uh, are probably going to play into pretty big games down the stretch. I think with Kyle Hamilton, what he gives to you a little bit more than Kayvon Thibodeau is that there's the athleticism profile that you want to see of a top five or a, a number one overall player. Not that we expect him to be the first pick in the draft, um, but there's also the refinement in the position specific skills that he needs. He can cover the ball skills are there. He's a great tackler. There's range against the run. He's a very useful blitzer too, being like six, four and 220 plus pounds. I think a little bit, and maybe I'm the only one that, that feels this way uh, that with Kayvon Thibodeau, you're there's a little bit of a projection that you want to see him uh, use pass rushing moves a little more frequently than he has in his first three seasons at Oregon. Freaky athletes got the size, got the length that you want to see in an edge rusher. But I think with Kyle Hamilton, he's a little bit of a higher floor right now than Kayvon Thibodeau. Yeah, these lists are instructive for a number of reasons because typically we work in our own little bubbles and then we come together every few weeks and we do the draft show every week and talk about you know the quarterbacks or, or the wide receivers or whatever. We don't get a sense for what the, the, the bigger... Uh, overarching list look like, except when we update the draft rankings. Uh, Josh, let me ask you this. So, again, so two things. How is my guy Aiden Hutchinson seven when he should be two? And by the end of the by the end of this thing, he might be one for me. And that's that's the direction I'm heading, yep. which is sort of crazy. And number two, is there any concern that Kyle Hamilton is going to take the Isaiah Simmons sort of path and won't be exactly? We don't know who he is by the time he gets to the NFL in year one or maybe year one and a half. Well, to address the first one, um, you know, we've said, or I've said previously that you guys were a little higher um, on Aiden Hutchinson than I was. I think he's made some strides this year. I don't think it's been as significant as um, maybe it's it's been what uh, people are led to believe. Um, you know, he, he's got a lot of power in his game. I just don't see as much of the, the quick twitch athleticism that I would want to see as I do. Um, from some of these other edge rushers. So that's why he's a little bit farther down for me. Still a very good player, higher than I expected to have him um, at this point in the process. But, um, you know, and then the, the latter question was Kyle Hamilton versus Isaiah Simmons. I think Kyle Hamilton is just better in coverage. Um, he's less of a liability than Isaiah Simmons was at this point in his career. Um, you know, I think he's a more well-rounded player, whereas, you know, Isaiah Simmons is still kind of coming into his 
zone. And I think Kyle Hamilton is more prepared to step in immediately and be able to make that that uh, adjustment from day one. So, Traps, you mentioned the injuries with Kyle Hamilton. Um, Drake London's now out with an injury. Derek Stingley's out with an injury. Um, are any of these things a concern for NFL teams? None of these are serious injuries as far as I know. Um, Drake London has a fractured ankle, which sounds terrible, but I think he should be fine. Cal Hamilton had the knee injury. I would imagine he's coming back. Daryl Stingley, I don't even know what he had, but or Derek Stingley, excuse me. But uh, if he doesn't come back, I, it wouldn't affect me one way or the other. It would actually make some sense. Uh, is there anyone concerned about these injuries or anyone now that's what we're talking about injury-wise traps that you, you have some concerns with? Not that I've been alerted to at this point. Like you mentioned, a lot of these are – uh, relatively minor injuries, and it is early enough uh, that if they do linger for even four to six months, these guys will be ready for mini camps or it, at the latest, the start of their first NFL training camp. And these are marquee prospects that we're talking about. I think even Drake London, who we're going to talk about later, uh, very athletic. It's not like these are players that are only finesse guys and they need to be 100% healthy to be the best player that they can be on the field. They're high caliber athletes and, and everything uh, in modern medicine today. And, and just what we've seen from these players ability to recover indicates that they'll be fine by the start of their rookie years. So just to recap uh, the top 10 list, because uh, if you're watching on YouTube, you can't see the graphics because we don't have the graphics up. Uh, number one, aggregate prospect rankings among me, Chris, and Josh. Cal Hamilton was number one. Kayvon Thibodeau, number two. Derek Stingley, Jr., number three. Evan Neal, fourth, followed by Tyler Linderbaum. He's a center, by the way, and he and a Garrett Bradbury center. Uh, number six, George Karloftis. Uh, Aiden Hutchinson, number seven. Garrett Wilson, number eight. Number nine, DeMarvin Leal. And number 10, Matt Corral. Uh, Josh, I'm going to put you on the spot. Are these top 10 guys, and this is something we should probably do, in the coming weeks, we'll go back and look at sort of who we had ranked as the top 10 guys uh, in the draft process and see which ones worked out, and which ones didn't. But if you had to put on your back to the future hat, which one of these guys would you be most concerned about as not living up to the top 10 hype based on, you know, our most recent prospect rankings? Yeah, as far as not living up to the hype, um, you know, I think there's the most variance with Matt Corral. Um, he's just elevated so highly in the process. You know, you still concerns about uh, the scheme and how that might translate to the next level. Obviously, situation and supporting cast are so important to a quarterback where they are taken in the in the NFL draft. I mean, you look at the Patriots, and again, Mac Jones makes me look stupid on a weekly basis as well as he's been performing. But <laughs> uh, yeah, take your victory lap. I mean, you've earned it for sure. But um, you know, Matt Corral, there's so much variance at the quarterback position. So it's certainly worth noting that that alone uh, brings a little bit of concern. I also have a little bit of a concern with the Marvin Leal, um, just because he's a little bit more of a tweener. He's got to be in that perfect situation uh, with a defensive coordinator that knows how to use him, a guy that can certainly play on the edge, but also has the capability of condensing inside. So you want to see him land in a position where uh, a coach is going to know how to use him uh, to his fullest potential. Yeah, I, and Leal, I haven't watched Texas A&M closely, just on broadcasts. He hasn't been blowing the doors off of it, just based on what I've seen uh, on Saturday afternoons. And I, I do have concerns about that, but I think if we went back and looked at the top 10, there are always going to be guys where you you know, you, you miss, and that's, whole, that's part of the deal. It's hard to, to project these guys for any number of reasons. Uh, usually, Talent isn't one of them. Usually it's something else that's going on. Um, I do wonder, and Traps, you sort of touched on this in terms of uh, Thibodeau being not raw, but he he's not a finished product. Is is he going to be Caleb on chase on? And I don't mean that in a bad way. Caleb on chase on probably in retrospect should have been a second round pick. Um, Josh Allen, the edge rusher for Jacksonville, was a legit first round pick, and I think he's he's flashed at times. But I'm not sure if Caleb on Chase is a little undersized. I'm not sure Thibodeau's undersized, but just in terms of the consistency from one play to the next, one series to the next, are we convinced that he's a top two guy? I'm not. I'm and that's not just like where we ultimately will rank them. I think we could be surprised on draft night uh, that he gets picked a little bit later, especially with the guys that we already mentioned, like Josh's guy, George Karloftis from Purdue and Aiden Hutchinson, who we all seem to like quite a bit. And like Josh has said, has played even better since like the last time we talked. Um, 
I could see at the edge rusher spot, those two players from the big 10 that have more NFL bodies and are again, better using their hands might be sought after more highly by a lot of NFL teams than cave on Thibodeau that may have, you know, 10 to, to 12 to 15 sack upside, but you might not get that until year two or year three. When I think Aiden Hutchinson and Carl Loftus can hit the ground running in the NFL. Yeah. I'm, I'm actually interested to see how this plays out. Cause I know Josh doesn't love Hutchinson as much as I do. Like for me, and I say this every week, I, I didn't love him the last two years, and this year it seems like something's clicked for him. And I do wonder if he's going to be – this might be one of these T.J. Watt trajectories where he goes to the mm. bottom of the first round, and you're like, why, when you see him play? And, you know, what happens is – and I, I do wonder if we all did the draft thing in our own little worlds and didn't have access to social media, how much more accurate we might be. And I try to do that every year, be less and less influenced by what people say. Mm -hmm. um, because it's just, it's a reality. And, and I think that's probably had something to do with TJ Watt. Um, and Josh, that's the lesson for you with Mac Jones. Trust your gut. If you, if you love him and that pot belly of his, you got to stick with it. Um, but I, I don't know. We, we'll see. And again, like I said, that's what makes it so interesting. Um, I'll ask one more thing about these top tens, then we'll move, move on. Josh, is there any concern at all about Tyler Lindenbaum being five? He's a center. And the last, since 2010, I think three centers have gone. Um, at, at the highest point in the first round, number 18, Marquise Pouncey, um, Garrett Bradbury, of course, and there's one other whose name, I think Ryan Kelly, perhaps, mm -hmm. might, might be the third one. Yep. Um, so, in these mock drafts, I'm not sure where you guys have them going, but I've had them routinely go in top 11, off into the yeah. Giants. Mm -hmm. um, so, Josh, it, it, is there a downside? I mean, do you see any, and I, I don't want to keep dumping on Prince's guy, but any sort of Garrett Bradbury Pratt Falls potholes with taking Tyler Lindenbaum so early? Not really. I mean, I think he certainly played well enough to warrant that, that level of consideration. Um, you know, when you're just scouting the players, he's certainly one of the 10 best players uh, in this draft class. I mean, for me personally, there's not a ton of prospects that I've given first round grades to that I've simply just fallen in love to. So there's, you know, there's a lot more, I guess, parity this year than maybe I've seen in previous years. Um, so it could go in any number of directions. But what you noted there with just the history of when centers are taken, I mean, number 18 overall being the highest, you know, that's that's not because we haven't seen centers that are very good players. That's That's more of the value at the position. So I do think in some way we need to adjust our minds uh, to prepare for the idea that he's not a top 10 pick even if the the level of talent that he has warrants being that top 10 caliber player. So no, I don't have any issues with, with talent and where we have him in the rankings. Uh, but I do think that we're probably going to have to prepare ourselves for him to be taken a little bit later than, than maybe we anticipated this early in the process. No, that's a good point. And everyone was dumping on Quentin Nelson going so high a few years ago, and that turned out to be the right pick, but you know, he's, he's a rare bird and he plays guard. He doesn't play center and, and maybe, uh, as someone who, as a Steelers fan who, who and likes Kendrick Green, the rookie who played guard at uh, Illinois before who to center here, it troubles me when he ends up five yards to the backfield in every snap. So that's how you can talk yourself into taking Tyler Linderbaum uh, as a top 10 pick. And by the way, Josh, I don't know if you saw my mock draft, which came out Tuesday morning. Pick number 16 had your Cleveland Browns taking Kenny Pickett <laughs> just to stir up the pot. <laughs> Brady Quinn, obviously a Browns fan, said, why don't you have the Steelers taking Kenny Pickett? And that is also a, a fair concern uh, because they, they need Kenny Pickett more than the Browns do, I think. Speaking of quarterbacks, and I mentioned Matt Corral is number 10 on our list. And truthfully, that's probably too high for Matt Corral. I mean, you sort of touched on it, Josh, that we don't know. It's hard to get a read on these on, on these quarterbacks for any number of reasons. Um, there's no clear-cut guy. There's no Trevor Lawrence. There's even no Joe Burrow, even though Kenny Pickett's making his case. I think we all agree, even though I have Kenny Pickett, I think I've had, had him going around one of the mock drafts the last two weeks. I don't think he's a first-round pick. I think he's a fringe first, second-round guy. But that's okay. I, I mean, you know, Kirk Cousins is a fourth-round pick, and he's, he's, he's usually a uh, top 12, top 13 quarterback. And he's been in the league since 2012, I believe. So, you know, it, it, like I said, it's hard to, to get these things sorted out. Matt Corral's 10th in our most recent prospect rankings list. Kenny Pickett all the way up to 15. Malik Wilson at 31. Carson Strong at 37. Uh, Traps, I'll start with you. Is Carson Strong that far down because of the knee, or do you have issues with 
other parts of his game, the talent he faces, lack of mobility? Well, it's kind of because of the knee and how that limits him on the field. That again, and and maybe your guy Mac Jones is the outlier in this uh, new era at the quarterback spot. But I feel like if you're a quarterback prospect coming into the NFL today and you cannot improvise uh, and make big plays happen with your legs or just keeping your eyes up field when there's pressure on you, eluding defenders, uh, defensive tackles, linebackers blitzing off the edge, then it's just going to be hard for you to be picked probably even in the first round that we haven't really seen a lot of statues get picked super early. I mean, even Daniel Jones, who kind of had the reputation as a pocket passer can certainly pick up some yards with his leg. So I think whether the, that knee injury from high school is really hampering him or not, it, to me, it, it kind of feels like it is watching him on film uh, to be someone that is strictly a pocket passer. You need to be hyper accurate. The processing's got to be great. Everything's got to be fine tuned uh, to be a first round pick. And beyond that, just to be good in the NFL, I, I think maybe Mac Jones is, is on that trajectory. Um, we'll see how it kind of plays out over the last half of his rookie season without having that ability to improvise. But that's really my hang up on Carson Strong that in terms of the downfield accuracy, the production, the experience, uh, I, I think he's pretty accurate uh, at the intermediate level, too. I'm just worried about his lack of mobility. Yeah, his knees are real concerned, and that bumps me out because he was my QB1 for the longest time, and now mm -hmm. it's sort of by default Matt Corral. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned the the rankings. Uh, Matt Corral, 10th, obviously, can pick 15th. Malik Willis, 31. Carson Strong, 37th on our list. And the two names I didn't mention uh, who made our top 100 Sam Howell all the way down to 55. Keaton Slovis down to 94. Is there a 25-point difference in your mind, 24-point difference in your mind, Josh, between Malik Willis at 31 and Sam Howell at 55? Because I don't, I'm don't. i taking both those guys. I'm probably taking them in the middle of the, third, uh, the, middle of the second round. I, I understand why there's so much to like about Malik Willis, but I don't know if that translates in the next two or three or four years in the NFL. Well, I think the endearing quality for Malik Willis is, you know, his mobility. Um, I think he's got a very strong arm. Uh, is there a big difference between him and Sam Howe? Like, as far as where he's going to be taken, yeah, I think there probably is, just because there's going to be teams that fall in love with that athleticism and believe that he can lean. He's got that crutch of being able to make plays out of structure or be able to tuck the ball and run it when the play breaks down. Uh, now, that shouldn't be his first option you know he's going to be a, pa a passer first but he's got that that ability to um, do some other things if the pocket breaks down where Sam Howell I think is who he is like he's broken a bunch of tackles but I don't think he's this running mobile quarterback that uh, is going to have a ton of success in that category in the NFL so um, and then what I've seen from him as a passer this year has been you know kind of frustrating I'm looking you know you were talking about Baker May or indirectly Baker Mayfield with the Brown situation. Uh, part of the concern with Baker right now is whether he's a guy that uplifts his team or if he's a product of the system. The Browns don't look the same when Nick Chubb is not healthy and in the game, um, which to me says that, you know, maybe Baker Mayfield isn't the guy that is going to pull his team along. And I'm afraid that Sam Howell, uh, who has drawn Mayfield comparisons throughout the process, might be viewed in a similar light. You know, he might be the guy that in a perfect situation is is capable of winning you some playoff games. But when things break down, he's not going to be somebody that pulls you along either. So uh, in terms of that, I think Malik Willis at least has the potential to reach a point where he can pull some of his teammates along, whereas how I think is just kind of who he is at this point. No, that's a fair point. And I like Malik Willis. I don't love him, and I try not to get caught up in the social media buzz around Malik Willis because I don't, I just don't see it week in and week out. But that doesn't mean it, it won't happen. I mean, a good example of playing a completely different position is um, Max Crosby coming out of college. I thought was he was weak. He needed to get a lot stronger. I remember watching him uh, a few games and going, "Okay, well, he's not strong enough to play on the edge." Hey, guess what? He got stronger. So I mean, guys can get better, and you have to sort of remind yourself that as you go through this process, that just because you see someone. Uh, uh, in a couple of games in college playing against obviously lesser competition. That doesn't mean that they with new coaching and new strength and conditioning coaches and all the other stuff, nutrition and whatever else you do as, a, as an NFL player, you can't get better. Um, so that's something to keep in mind with Malik Willis. I think you're exactly right, Josh, about Sam Howe. He's drawn comparisons from Baker May to Baker Mayfield from day one. 
And I don't think there's anyone anywhere that thinks Sam Howell's a better prospect coming out of UNC than Baker was coming out of Oklahoma. Uh, Baker obviously went first overall, and, and he earned every bit of that. Sam Howell has had not a great year. I, I mean, he actually played pretty well in that pit game last Thursday night. That offensive line is straight up dog doo-doo for UNC. They are not helping him. But he does look to run a lot. And I think Traps talked about this last week. First read, head down, run. Maybe part of that is he's tired of getting hit in the face. But I don't even know if he's as is as athletic as Baker. And Baker's, you know, underrated as an athlete. I think he moves pretty well outside of the pocket. And Sam does too. But again, do you want your quarterback taking 10, 15, 20 hits a game? I don't know how that math works out if you're trying to, I mean, you know, Debo can tell you about Carson Wentz in Philadelphia and, and some on some level he's doing the same thing in Indianapolis and, and he's banged up a lot of the times. So, yeah, I think the takeaway is this draft class quarterback-wise isn't super sexy. That said, um, Traps, I'll ask you this. Uh, is Corral going to go? Is he going to be the first quarterback taken? Because I would imagine there's some math somewhere where <clears throat> Pickett might be the first guy off the board or maybe Malik Willis. I don't even know. That's a really good question. I think right now, if you're betting on it, you would have to put the money on Matt Corral because two seasons as a starter, he's in the SEC. The stats have improved this year. They were pretty high volume last year. The interceptions are down. And then again, just beyond all of the resume stuff, you watch the film and he does have a pretty strong arm. He has what I call arm talent or, or how I categorize arm talent, not just the ability to throw it hard or throw it far, but when he's on the run, when there's a defender in his face, he can still throw accurately with good velocity to the intermediate level down the field. And then he's a good runner too. So he kind of checks a lot of the boxes, maybe not as emphatically as like Trevor Lawrence and Justin Fields and even Trey Lance last uh, draft season in terms of what the prototypical quarterback looks like. But right now, Corral's got to be the odds on favorite to be the first quarterback off the board. Josh, can you make a case for Kenny Pickett? And I say that because just look no further than um, last night's game where Trey Lance still is not getting on the field and they just, the 49ers ran by traditionally running the ball with running backs and even Debo Samuel, a little non-traditional there, while Jimmy G, pocket passer, went 15 to 19. I think you can make a case because I don't think there uh, is a runaway quarterback candidate this year. So I think you can make a case for you know, multiple guys. In the case of Kenny Pickett, uh, he's done a great job of throwing with touch. He's layering his throws this year. Um, you know, he is not the most athletic, but he's athletic enough. You know, the the, the Joe Burrow-like type of quarterback. Um, you know, so for that reason, yeah, you could absolutely make a case for him to be the first quarterback off the board, just like you could make a case for uh, Matt Corral or Malik Willis. I think when you consider the NFL, it's a copycat league. Um, I think there's going to be more teams that are trying to find a Joe Burrow or a Lamar Jackson or, you know, the Kyler Murrays of the world, as opposed to, uh, you know, like we were talking about before with a, with a Baker Mayfield. Um, so I think you can make a case for probably any one of those three guys. I think it's probably going to be one of those three at this point. Um, and again, you can make a case for any one of the three. So Josh, if you had, which quarterbacks typically are going in your first round every week now? So the two going in the first round every week are Matt Corral and Malik Willis. And then occasionally I'll have a uh, picket slide in there in the back end of the first round. And how, what is the highest once we get around to April that you think a quarterback can go off the board? As crazy as it sounds. I mean, I would not rule out all the way up into the top three. Uh, Yikes. Not because I personally would do that, but uh, simply because quarterback needs uh, drive everything. I mean, there's going to be teams that overpick the position. There were years where EJ Manuel was a first round pick, Blaine Gabbard. I mean, we can list the number of quarterbacks that were taken in the first round. Cleveland's had their share uh, with Brandon Weed and Johnny Manziel. Like, you know, I think, um, we've seen a number of quarterbacks taken in the first round that did not warrant that consideration. So whether we like it or not, the need at that position is going to, you know, it's going to lead some teams to do crazy things. So, uh, you know, maybe it's one of those EJ Manuel years where the first one doesn't come off the board until the teens. But I don't think anybody expected Blake Bortles to be the third overall pick uh, the year that he came out either. So, you know, we're, we're, due, or Mitchell Trubisky, number two overall. I mean, we're due for a surprise at any given point. Um, so while I don't think one should go that high, I wouldn't roll it out. Yeah. That Mr. Trubisky one, it, you could argue that Mr. Trubisky is not the top quarterback, maybe not even the top two quarterbacks in this draft class. If we're sort of resorting that order, 
because he, he didn't play. He was uh, sort of a one year wonder at UNC and, and a Ryan Tannehill sense that he didn't have a lot of snaps of quarterback traps. How, how high do you see? Like, could a quarterback go three overall? Yeah, I think so. And Josh outlined it really well. One other point that I want to bring up on kind of making the case for Kenny Pickett, and it, it revolves around your guy, Ryan, Mac Jones, that if Mac Jones continues to play well as this high floor but low ceiling kind of quarterback, NFL ready, like that's more Kenny Pickett than it is Matt Corral or certainly Malik Willis. And, and everything I said about you know teams wanting to have this highly athletic guy that can create off structure, even like Patrick Mahomes and Josh Allen, you know they took time to become the quarterbacks that they are today. So if it's a copycat league, like Josh said, which it certainly is, and Mac Jones uh, wins rookie of the year running away and the Patriots look really good and they're deep into the playoffs, there will be teams that will say, hey, let's pick someone like Kenny Pickett, because he's older, he's NFL ready, he's started for four years. Uh, let's not worry about three or four or five years down the road, like a lot of teams of late have at the quarterback spot. But yes, it would not surprise me. Um, it obviously will depend on who it is. is. Is it the Washington football team? What do the Giants do with those first two picks? How does Daniel Jones play down the stretch? It, if he doesn't play well, maybe Dave Gettleman gets fired and there's a new GM there. Uh, so yeah, it, it would not surprise me at all if we see a quarterback in the top three or the top five, because like Josh said, the need at that position is more available than anything else. Yeah. And you, you sort of touched on it, traps. You talk about um, high floor, low ceiling. That ain't necessarily a, a bad thing. And mm -hmm. when you're talking about quarterback, because let's just look quickly. So Joe Burrow could be described as a high floor, low ceiling guy, just yep. because of the athleticism. He's doing fine. Two would be the opposite. And he struggled because of injuries. I think Justin Herbert's a, a, a a low floor, high ceiling guy, just based on the way he played. And he's obviously exceeding expectations. And that, that's a, that's something you don't want to talk about if you're Chris Greer, uh, of the dolphins, Jordan love, uh, high, high ceiling guy, low floor guy. Haven't seen a whole lot of them. Depot's Jalen hurts is actually doing pretty well. I'm just going down the list of guys who were just recently drafted. Um, so yeah, you're, you're taking your risk. I mean, drew lock second round pick. He was a high ceiling guy. He's been a disappointment. Dwayne Haskins. Oh my God. This, the, throwing lousy passes, according to Aditi Kinkabwala before the Steelers games. By the way, Aditi, all he throws is lousy passes, so I don't know if it matters whether he's checking his phone <laughs> or not. I don't know if that's calling him out either way. Kyler Murray, obviously, uh, low floor, high ceiling guy. He's exceeded expectations when he's healthy. So it's a crapshoot, and I think you might be onto something, Traps, in that teams. It's a copycat league, and you see, oh, we can get a guy who does 80% of what we want him to do, and he does it 90% of the time instead of 50% of the time. Maybe that's a better trade-off than trying to find Mike Vick or whatever you're looking for. All right, let's go to um, the top 100 list here. We'll, we'll, we'll start off with guys that are ranked too high uh, among the first 32 picks. And, and Traps, I'll start with you. Who was someone on the, on the list of 32 there who you thought, you know, I don't, I don't know if he's going to going to go that high when it's all said. This is not, yeah, this is not going to be too popular, but mine's Jordan Davis, the defensive tackle, nose tackle from Georgia. He has flashed a little bit more as a pass rusher, but I, I was a guy that was not very uh, big on Derek Brown from Auburn going inside the top 10, two drafts ago. Like I, I just think that we've kind of had an indirect conversation here about positional value and should a center go in the top five and quarterbacks because of their value will ultimately go really high, like inside the top 10 or even the top five in almost every draft. Uh, I just feel like a player that is really, really good against the run and might occasionally give you a splash play here or there as a pass rusher, like that's not worth a top 20 overall player in this draft. Um, Josh, let me ask you this, because um, I don't feel dissimilarly than you to make that a complicated sentence. I feel the same way you do traps about about Jordan Davis because he's six, six, three sixty, whatever he is. He feels like a two down player to me, maybe a two and a half down player. If you want to do the math, I did like Derek Brown a lot. I liked Javon Kinlaw a lot. I was okay with what those guys went. Um, but I think in terms of body type, Jordan Davis feels more like Dexter Lawrence. I don't think he's as good as Dexter Lawrence. So I've had him going in the bottom half, even the bottom third of the first round where are you, like number one, comparison to Dexter Lawrence, Josh, and number two, where would you have him going or where have you had, um, Jordan Davis going in your mock drafts. I've had him going to teens um, or the 20s, somewhere in there. I like the idea of him possibly going to the Chargers or the Broncos or the Cowboys or um, as recently as this weekend, coming around to the idea of the Bruns possibly using a pick on him with uh, as poorly as, 
as they've done stopping the run here of late. Um, you know, I think he's shown a lot of improvement as a pass rusher, so I think he does have that three-down capability. Now, as far as conditioning, does he have the conditioning to be on, on the field for all three of those downs? Uh, that's a different question. But uh, when you evaluate the player, you kind of have to consider what level of impact he's going to have on your team because if he's going to have a Vita Vea type impact on your defense, then you're you're comfortable getting that quality of a player. Because um, you know the reality is, if you hit on him, if he's a good player, maybe he's not exceptional. You're going to be happy with that all day because we see so many players taken in the first round that end up being bust. So you would rather have a good player as opposed to a bust any given point in time. Um, but I think for the right team, he certainly has some first round capability uh, for sure. He's he's going to have to go into the right system, of course, a team that knows his skill set. Um, he's not going to be everybody's cup of tea. And quite frankly, it's a discussion that. Uh, is going to be very polarizing across the league. I mean, you know, you got discussing it there a little bit. The idea of taking kind of a nose tackle. I mean, we're talking about the pass rush ability, but at the end of the day, he's he's more of a run stuffing type defensive tackle. Um, that's where his bread is buttered at the end of the day. So if you're not comfortable taking that in the first round, then he's not going to be for you. But I do think that there is going to be at least one team that is comfortable uh, with him in terms of his run stopping ability, and then also the the ability that he can give you on third down. So um, I think he's going to go in the first round. I'm comfortable with that. Uh, but at the end of the day, I understand the discussion that maybe he's not for everybody. Yeah, look at some he's, recent drafts. You, you mentioned Vita VA. He went 12th overall, and that's exactly where Vita VA should have gone. I don't think he's – I don't like Jordan Davis at 12. Uh, Deron Payne went one pick after 13th. What were you going to say, Traps? No, I was going to say he's going to the Baltimore Ravens. He just feels like a Baltimore Ravens type of defensive lineman. Like they like those oversized players in the trenches. Brandon Williams is getting up there in age. Clayus Campbell is like, was he like 36 years old? Like they eventually have to kind of reinvigorate that defensive line with some youth. He just feels like a Baltimore Ravens, like late twenties pick for me in April. And yeah, I'll say this. It's, it's not so much his pass rush potential is not so much measured on sacks um, alone because you've seen the way that Vita Vea is able to impact the game uh, just with his, you know, his size. I mean, his ability to collapse pockets, uh, fill run gaps. I mean, he's occupying two defenders at a time, allowing guys to come around on those, those uh, tackle end stunts and get free to the quarterback. So, you know, he may not have the sack numbers at the end of the day, but if he's creating opportunities, for his teammates, that's got to be measured too. And he's certainly done that for Georgia. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, Josh, is he better than Danny Shelton? I'm just looking over the list. He was the first round pick of the Ooh. Browns back in 2015. He you went, know, uh, it, let me see. He went, oh, he went 12th overall. My God. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So Danny Shelton was, um, he, I, we kept hearing the word dancing bear uh, used to refer to Danny Shelton during the, during the draft process. Uh, I think at times he wanted to be a little bit more of a pass rusher than he was just a run stuffer. Um, you know, and he eventually he came into his own and had some good seasons later in his career with uh, the Patriots. But obviously a pick did not go well for Cleveland. I mean, we could sit here all day and talk about the picks that did not go well for Cleveland, unfortunately. But yeah, but at um, the time, I do think Davis is it? A, yeah, at the time, I thought he was a very player. I thought it was something that they needed. You know, I sold him myself on the idea that they were going to build through the trenches. And at the end of the day, that's where you win football games. I still believe that, uh, but it's about getting the right players in the trenches. And uh, Danny Shelton just was not the right player uh, for Cleveland. I, I think, I think Jordan Davis is a better player though. I think he kind of understands his role at the end of the day. Um, and then the added ability of being able to collapse those pockets is something that just gives him additional value. Speaking of the trenches, uh, Josh, you have Zion Johnson, guard from Boston College, is ranked too high. He's 31 on our list, uh, draft prospect rankings. Um, Traps must love him because I didn't love him either. So what's your thoughts on Zion Johnson? Yeah, so I do like him better as a guard as opposed to a tackle. Um, you know, I love his awareness. I love his ability to uh, re-engage with his hands and, you know, marry his feet, that kind of stuff in run blocking, uh, pass protection. But my issue with him is that his pad level gets a little bit too high. He has trouble absorbing contact a lot of times. And, you know, he just gets, he gets bent backwards 
quite frankly, on more more occasions than I'm comfortable with. So while I understand the the idea that he could be one of the top level guards in this class, I don't think he's quite there yet. So that's why I put him um, on my high list. I wasn't really uncomfortable with our list as a whole. Uh, so I'm just kind of nitpicking at this point. But Zion Johnson, to me, is a guy who is trending upwards but I would still like to see some of that ability to drop anchors, sink his hips a little bit, um, you know, when bull, when when facing those bull rushes to be that first round caliber prospect. And I'll be honest, straight up, uh, the hardest position for me to evaluate is offensive line. Like I just don't have a real sense for. I mean, Jedrick Wills, I knew was going to be good, but I think any moron would could figure that out. Alex Leatherwood was a, a guy in another direction. I think the, the 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 giveaway is if the Raiders draft someone in the first round, you you might want to be like, well, that might not work out. But um, so I don't know. Like Zion Johnson, when I watched him over the summer, I was like, okay, I, I get it. Um, but we'll see. And the same with uh, who's the offensive tackle for Miami, whose name escapes me. Zion Nelson. There you go. I thought I thought it was a Z. Yeah, and that he's just extremely raw. He's he's not on on our top thirty two here, but he's another guy that that comes to mind. My player that was ranked uh, a little too high. He came in at 21, and he has a chance to be a first-round pick, a South Carolina edge rusher, Kingsley, uh, Ignac, Bore. Um, like him? It's just a, a situation where sometimes, and this happens a lot with, with edge rushers, even in the NFL, that, uh, you know, you, you say they're a first-round talent, and then they disappear for stretches. I think uh, Ignac, Bore, Ignac Bore needs to get stronger. But, uh, again, I just said about Max Crosby a few minutes ago, he needed to get stronger, he got stronger, and now you can't block him. Um, so it can happen. And he can certainly play like a first round talent once he gets to the next level, but I just don't see it play in and play out. Um, and again, when you're in the SEC, you're playing against dudes every week. So it's not going to be a case where you're just dominating guys uh, in a conference where a bunch of players after college are going to go on to do something else that isn't football related. So uh, is he a first round talent? Yeah. Is he going to be in the conversation? Yeah. Does he need to improve some things? Yeah, he does. But I, I suppose we can say that about everyone. But he was a guy that I thought maybe at 21 was a little high maybe closer to the, to the 31, 35 range. But at the end of the day, it's the middle of November. Uh, a lot can change. Um, all right, let's go to rank two low. Guys who should have been higher in your mind. Josh, I'll start with you. Who you got? So I went with Jamison Williams. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, I hadn't really watched him when we were discussing him, but I went back and I started watching him a little bit more. Um, loved the fluidity in his game, his ability to get open at all three levels. Um, really dynamic after the catch. I mean, I, I get some Justin Jefferson to his game when I watch him. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, when Justin Jefferson was coming out, I said he was closer to that, that Henry Ruggs, Jerry, Judy, you know, crop at the top as opposed to the next group of, of wide receivers behind him. Um, come to find out, you know, he, he should have been higher than probably those guys that, uh, you know, were getting the acclaim that they had gotten in the process. Josh, but don't, don't forget Jalen Rager, Debo's favorite player. They could have had Justin Jefferson and Devontae Smith, and now they have Jalen Rager. I didn't unintentionally forget Jalen Rager. I just <laughs> was not. Uh, he was in the camp that, uh, and, and Debo will admit this, like, you know, you saw the Vikings' reaction when Philadelphia took Jalen Rager. They're like, they, they took Jalen Rager? You know, we got Justin Jefferson sitting here, and they took him. Like, it felt like a gift to them. Um, they understood what they were getting, and, you know, I saw the same thing. I think J Justin Jefferson was – uh, primarily used in the slot, but a guy that had much more uh, capability beyond what he showed in Baton Rouge. And I think Jamison Williams, uh, now that he is free of, of Ohio State in that deep depth chart, um, is able to show a little bit of what he's capable of. And I think he's still scratching the surface and he's he's got room to climb. I love I love Jameson Williams, and it is hysterical every time you have to think about he had to leave Ohio State to get playing time at Alabama. Um, that's that's incredibly funny. Traps, your guy is a guy that I love, and I think I've had him going in, in my mock draft every single week. He currently sits at number fifty, which leads me to believe that Josh hates him. Who is it? Trent McDuffie, the cornerback, defensive back from Washington. He's allowed like ten catches for fifty-seven yards on the season, and really. Watching his film, like he's not thrown or like the football is not thrown in his vicinity very often. And I don't think what I like about him is that he's not uh, someone that is this strict press man uh, cornerback. Like we've seen a lot of those guys that we all really like, like Jeffrey Akuda, uh, that have struggled out of the gate. I think if that's your bread and butter and being an on an island cornerback, 
coming into the NFL, it's a pretty steep learning curve because then you're not facing big 10 receivers or even SEC receivers. You're facing teams. Number ones with little to no safety help. Uh, Trent McDuffie's can play man, but he's good in his zone. Uh, has three pass breakups on the season, had a couple last year and a couple interceptions. I just like what Washington does schematically. They've sent a lot of good defensive backs to the NFL. He seems like kind of a high floor and even someone that has a high ceiling uh, at that defensive back spot. I love him. I love the way he plays. He plays mostly outside, mm-hmm. but he feels like a slot guy to me. He feels like I've compared him at times to the Teron Matthew. Uh, just in terms of the way he plays and the physicality with which he plays, um, Josh. Quickly, do you are you not crazy about him, or are you just he's it's you haven't seen him yet, or what's that's the deal with Trent McDuffie for you? Yeah, no, I like him. I haven't seen him enough this year to uh, change his grade, which is probably what drags him down a little bit in our rankings. Um, the same is true of Nicobe Dean. You know, I've seen Nicobe Dean like I've I've watched that Georgia defense enough to know the type yeah. of plays that he's been making. Uh, but I haven't focused on him enough to the, where I've changed his grade. So a um, couple of guys that, you know, will probably be moving up even farther by the time we have our next update. Uh, but Washington, I mean, obviously moving on from, from Jimmy Lake, that's a, that's a team that has done a fantastic job of producing defensive backs as well. Um, you know, you've got Kyler Gordon in that same secondary. You had Elijah Molden coming out of there last year. Um, you know, you've had a lot of talent coming out of that program in recent years. So to say that Kyler Gordon or Trent McDuffie are the next to come out, like I would not be surprised at all because those guys are always so well prepared. That is the thing. They're secretly uh, a pretty good um, defensive back factory, which you don't necessarily think about the Washington. Uh, my guy that I feel like is ranked too low came in at 23, which, you know, isn't low at all, relatively speaking, but I love him and I've, Fall in love with him quite quickly over the last few months because I didn't I wasn't a big fan this summer. Drake London, the wide receiver for USC, ankle injury done for the year. He should be fine. Um, I think he's gonna be better than Michael Pittman. And it was only a few weeks ago that I was saying, well, there's no way this guy's gonna be Michael Pittman. He won't run as fast as Michael Pittman, but uh he's six five and all he does is make plays. He played in eight games, six of those games he had over 130 receiving yards. Uh, let's see here. According to PFF and their advanced metrics, he's third in the country in, in forcing missed tackles. So he's a yak machine. He's third in the country in, on deep catches. He had 15 deep balls. So he catches screen passes. He ranks six in, in terms of catching screen passes uh, at 27, which means that he can do it at every level. Um, and, and I think that tour, that uh, contested catches, he's first in the league and in, in college football at 19. And I think I had him going my most recent mock draft to the Patriots, just throwing jump balls to, uh, I think that's right. I have to double check. Max Jones throwing jump balls to him would make his life a little easier. We saw Kendrick Bourne had that great touchdown reception on Sunday between two defenders on a jump ball. I think Drake London makes that happen uh, every week, several times a week, and he makes it look easy. Uh, is he the best wide receiver in this class? Probably not. I mean, we just talked about Jameson Williams, who's incredibly athletic. And I think he's only going to get more and more popular as we get through this process. Garrett Wilson and Chris Olave are going to be interesting in terms of how we evaluate these guys because your knee-jerk reaction is, to, okay, well, those guys are clearly the best. They play at Ohio State. They're putting up huge numbers every year. But Drake Jackson, uh, Drake London, excuse me, has made himself a lot of money, as we like to say. And he might end up being like the second-best wide receiver in this class by the time it's all said and done. Um, but, hey, we'll find out together. All right, one more thing, and we'll get out of here. Favorite, down the list, sleepers. Trapasso, we'll start with you. First off, I totally agree with you on Drake London and and what I do like about him uh, at 6'5", 220 is that he can get open. Like he is a former basketball player on the USC basketball team, and that shows in his routes. He's not just a contested catch receiver, and obviously that's important. You have to be able to get open in today's NFL. But my favorite down the list player is another wide receiver, Boston College's Zay Flowers. And we think of Boston College the last, like, I don't know, my whole life basically – uh, that it's a run heavy program with AJ Dillon and Andre Williams back in the day. But Zay Flowers averaged over 15 yards per catch as a freshman, then last year as a sophomore, and now he's over 16 yards per catch this year on a team that, again, still wants to run the football quite often. He's smaller, but he's really shifty. And because of that yards per catch average, it kind of indicates that he's good vertically. There's a couple of plays that he's actually been missed on where he's open down the field. I think he just fits with what teams want in that second or third round wide receiver. He's not going to come in and be your number one right away, 
But in the slot, if you can scheme him open, get him some screens, some easy completions from the quarterback, and then let him stretch the field vertically, I think Zay Flowers is going to fly way under the radar coming from Boston College. Not, you know, a, a bunch of 1,500 yard seasons, but when you look at what he's done in terms of per catch, be around 16, 17 yards per catch is pretty impressive for like a five foot 10, 180 pound wide receiver. He fits with what teams need at the receiver spot in today's NFL. Um, Isaiah McKenzie type or better? I think he's a little better, but similar. I think he'll be uh, used in more of a prominent role once he gets to the NFL than Isaiah McKenzie, but that kind of juice, like he's quick and he's fast down the field. Man, Isaiah McKenzie's 5'8", 173. That's what he's listed as. So little. Probably 5'6", 165. <laughs> All right. And he's vaccinated. We know that. Josh, what do you got? Who's your down-the-list sleeper? Well, I do like Zay Flowers uh, quite a bit, too. And to tra traps to your point, I mean, we saw last year how teams valued speed at the wide receiver position. I mean, the number of wide receivers that, um, you know, we're taking on day two that we're kind of known for their speed. You've got Rondale Moore, you know, Dwayne Eskridge, you've got Anthony Schwartz, like uh, Tutu Atwell, like, you know, you talk about five, eight, like Tutu Atwell was five, eight with platform shoes on, Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, so we saw the level of speed that teams were looking for last year. And Zay Flowers is uh, certainly one of those guys that, you know, can give you a lot underneath but um, can also push the ball downfield. I will say, and Debo, go ahead and ring bell, because I, I have to mention Wandale Robinson from Kentucky. He's going to be a player that rises up our board uh, before the end of the year, because at Nebraska, he was a guy that was used closer to the line of scrimmage. Um, at Kentucky, he's being used at all three levels, much like Jahan Dotson. So mm. uh, Wandale Robinson, a guy that uh, pound for pound, like Rondale Moore a, a year ago, uh, is very strong and somebody to to keep on your radar. Um, my sleeper in this class, uh, and he's not really a sleeper, he's just down our, our top 100 a little bit. It's Oklahoma defensive lineman Isaiah Thomas, um, a guy that I didn't love that much last year. Um, that Oklahoma front was very versatile. They had a lot of guys that uh, they rotated in and out, so it was kind of difficult to uh, get a feel for where each of those guys were, um, you know, on a down-to-down -down basis because a lot of guys can show juice when they're just coming in, you know, every couple of snaps, sitting out a, a series and then coming back in fresh. But uh, Isaiah Thomas is a guy that has tremendous power in his hands, but I've been most impressed with his ability to, um, you know, string together moves and get to the quarterback. I've seen a lot more uh, diversity in his pass rush this year as opposed to the previous years. Um, he's a little bit of a tweener, kind of that defensive end to tackle, but that's in vogue in the NFL now. I mean, that's what we call a, a defensive chess piece, a, mis a mismatch uh, for defenses to use because that's a player that can play on the edge. That's a guy that can condense inside, like at the Marvin Leal um, or Trayvon Walker at, at Georgia. Those types of players are covered in today's NFL. And I think Isaiah Thomas is a guy that is trending up based on the way that he's played this year. So you mentioned Wondell Robinson and we talked about Zay Flowers. Where does Wondell rate compared to Lynn Bowden Jr., who was a day two guy for the Raiders and they somehow, like I just mentioned, the Raiders in the draft picture, I'd be concerned about. They traded him before the season even started, months after drafting him. But Lynn Bowden, I liked him coming out. Well, how does he compare to those sort of guys we're talking about? Yeah, Lynn was a little more slippery. He was, uh, you know, better at slipping tackles, whereas Wandale, I think, is just a better route runner. Um, he's going to be where you expect him to be. Uh, and he's got some juice after the catch as well. Like, I'm not trying to undersell him and say that he's not slippery, but Lynn was just different. I mean, guys just kind of fell off him when they tried to make tackles, whereas uh, Wandale, I think, is just a little bit more of a complete wide receiver. Lynn could also play quarterback. He had to play quarterback a couple games, right? Kentucky the whole right? season, yeah. right? Wasn't yeah. it the whole season almost. It was probably three quarters of the season. They, yeah. they won a bowl game with him at quarterback. Yeah. He's that's awesome. He was a, a rare talent for sure. All right. My favorite down the list sleeper is uh and guy, uh, tra um, Josh, I think this is a guy that you've been on for a while. I didn't watch him until a few days ago and I was absolutely blown away. Central Michigan offensive lineman, offensive tackle, Bernard Raymond converted tight end. He played tight end in 2019 in college. He's a foreign exchange student originally from Austria. Um, I think, uh, isn't, what's his name? Austrian, the little 
kickboxer guy the what's that guy's name the the actor jean claude i think jean claude is austrian oh. <laughs> i couldn't think of his name i think Jean-Claude i thought you were looking for an mma fighter or me something. too i, I was like i do not know mma van damme. <laughs> yeah i i can't believe i blanked on jean claude van damme's name i apologize jean claude i think he's austrian it could be wrong but uh anyway blood sport's a great movie it's one of my favorites yeah bernard Wolf raymond is a right? good foot and a half taller than jean claude and a much better uh, football <laughs> player but 2019, he was a tight end in college. I think he had like 10 catches or something. 2020, during the COVID season, he moved to left tackle uh, and did pretty well. And this year, he has been great. And what games did I watch? I watched the two SEC games, LSU and Missouri this year. Missouri, yeah. And, dude, that guy looked every bit like he belonged in the SEC the way he played. I think he gave up one pressure. I don't know if he gave up a sack or not, but it was like one or two pressures uh, in two games, and he was moving guys off the ball. His athleticism is through the roof. I think he made Bruce Feldman's freak list before the season. I'd have to double check on that. But based on the Washington move, that's exactly what he looked like. Oh, Debo points out I was wrong about John claude John claude is from Belgium, so my apologies. I would imagine the people <laughs> who are confused for being Austrian and Belgian probably don't like that confusion. So, is it, isn't Arnold from from Austria? Maybe uh, I think yeah. Debo have yeah. to. That's not who you're thinking of. Yeah, they're probably closer in size. But Bernard Raymond is <laughs> – I had him going to my first round just because I don't – I mean, maybe he's not a first-round pick. But here's the thing. Like, if I'm watching him and if he were wearing a different uniform, uh, an LSU uniform, for example, I'd be like, oh, yeah, this guy's a first-round pick. But he plays for Central Michigan, and, you know, sometimes you have some trepidation. Central Michigan has a history of putting out guys. Joe Staley, Eric Fisher, J.J. Watt went there as a tight end. Antonio Brown went there. Uh, for for a bit, so they they put out football players, they put out offensive linemen, and in those two games that I watched, I had very little concerns about him being a good player at the next level. Maybe take some time because he hasn't played very long, but it wasn't a situation where you see a project that's moved uh, to offensive tackle recently, whether they're playing tight end or defensive uh, on the defensive line or whatever. And you say, okay, I can see that he has some skills there, but it's going to take some time. With Bernard Raymond, I thought he looked like he belonged, and not only did he belong. Uh, he was at times just dominating um, his position. Incredibly smart. His head was always up. He never rarely confused by stunts. Uh, great combo blocker. Great out in space. I don't know what else you could look for. Um, Josh, you you have been on Raymond for a while. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. You have any um, yeah. objections he's, to what I'm uh, saying? No, I don't. He's um, So he's very athletic for his size. Um, you know, you, you touch on his background with playing the tackle position, I think that gives you some optimism that there's still a little bit of room for growth for him. Um, One thing that I did come across, and this probably needs fact checked, but I think he's going to be 24 or 25 as a rookie. I think you're right. um, Which for the analytically um, inclined, that's going to be an issue for some teams because you're already thinking ahead to uh, second and third contracts where, you know, as an offensive lineman, you've got a little more longevity than say a running back. Uh, but you have to take that into consideration um, when you're factoring in Raymond. Uh, that Missouri game specifically, I think you see you see the potential. Um, he also has some of those issues with um, just sinking his hips and absorbing that contact. So he's got some areas where he can continue to improve. Uh, but at the end of the day, I mean, you look at the athleticism, the mobility, that's the kind of stuff that you get excited about uh, with an offensive tackle that could possibly go in the first round. Have you seen him yet, Traps? I have. I think he's definitely going to go in the first round. Like I, I, I think with what he's shown, like you mentioned, that he was just a tight end in 2019. Like, and as Josh pointed out, he's not perfect right now. But to a lot of the points that you made, Ryan, like there's not a lot of glaring weaknesses to his game. I think teams are going to say, "Hey, look, this is someone that's played in a handful of games at left tackle. He's six foot seven. Uh, he can add 10 to 15 to 20 pounds once he gets to the NFL without probably losing a lot of his athleticism. Like what he's shown this early in his left tackle playing career, uh, imagine what he could be in two or three seasons. So I think he's that Mac um, blocker who ultimately flies up the draft boards, probably not a, a top half of the first round guy, but for a lot of the left tackle needy teams in the back half of the first round, I think he will ultimately go there. And, you know, we talk about quarterbacks getting off, uh, overdrafted. Um, off the tackles get, uh, off the linemen in general, get overdrafted all the time. Mm-hmm. And, and I can certainly see uh, Austin Jackson. I'm looking quickly at the list. Austin Jackson went 18th, and he, 
you could argue is more, more of a project or is just as much of a project as, as, as Raymond is. Uh, yep. Dylan Radins went in the second round, and I liked him. I didn't love him. Ezra Cleveland, second round pick, liked him, didn't love him. So there are guys you can look at and say, I, I get uh, why you drafted him. I understand that Andre Dillard, uh, you know, we just didn't know if he could run block. Turns out he can't, but that's just a, a function of playing at Washington State at the time. Um, so Caleb McGarry, Titus Howard was a first round pick. Alex Leatherwood. Alex oh boy. Alex Leatherwood. So yeah, you can go down down the list and you can find guys and say, Yeah, I understand why that team drafted him and maybe overdrafted a person because it's an incredibly important position. One other name I'll mention, then we'll get out of here. And and I saw this guy and about three other players on this defense while watching my my guy Aiden Hutchinson. David Ajabo is a grown man. He is 60th on our list now. He will be higher than that. I have an early second round grade on him right now as we sit here. I think I've seen a couple games. Um, Josh Ross, the linebacker, who I think is number 12, is really good. Daxton Hill, the safety, is really good. Uh, and of course, um, Hutchinson is a, a top two guy for me as we sit here right now. So Ajabo is a guy to watch, edge rusher. And Michigan just keeps putting out edge rushers. It, it's, um, I don't know if it's an under the radar story, but but it's a it's a fun story nonetheless. Um, so yeah, that's it. I think that's a wrap on episode four of the old pick six mock draft show. So remember subscribe on YouTube, subscribe on the old, uh, anywhere you get your podcast, just get the audio version of this thing, turn on the alerts so you can uh, get the bell notifications. Uh, the alerts when we do, do the live shows, what's happen after every nationally televised game. And then things like the, uh, the YouTube draft show, which typically goes live on Tuesdays at 1 PM. Uh, and until next week, it is me, Ryan Wilson, Josh Edwards, Chris Paso. We'll talk to you guys later.